Well, thanks. Um, first off, I should mention, anybody get the reference to B612? Anybody read The Little Prince? Um, Little Prince lived on an asteroid called B612. That's where the name came from. I'll, I might tell you the story if you ask me later. But um, I facetiously call this saving the world um, because there is an outside chance um, that it may in fact be the most <coughs> important project on this planet right now. And you, you don't know until you, f until, you know, get to the future and find out. But um, first off, let's start with a little introduction to orbital <coughs> mechanics. I'm not sure if anybody here uh, comes from astronomy, but I, th I thought it'd be good to review what the solar system looks like. So here is a map of the solar system. It, 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 uh, it's actually, is there a way to get these lights down up here? Just say it loudly, will it magically <laughs> happen, or is there a, ha, ah. I love it. Okay, so um, this is an anatomically accurate map of the solar system in that we have taken the, uh, the NASA database of every single known asteroid, uh, plotted it here, uh, so they're all correctly rendered. Um, a little more than a million in the asteroid belt, 10,000 here. This is the Earth, this is the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, that's the asteroid belt. We don't care about those asteroids in some sense because they don't hit us. The ones that are in here are called near-Earth asteroids. They have been once thrown out of the asteroid belt and they're in Keplerian orbits, which means they just go round and round and round and round, just like the Earth does. And, uh, <coughs> sorry, excuse the, uh, the bumpiness. This is what happens when you embed videos in PowerPoint. But uh, you can see that there's a lot of asteroids out there and they do come very close to the Earth. As if you watch the Earth's, the light green line going by. However, we know that there are many, many more near-Earth asteroids than this because we've only been able to find about one, less than 1% of them. So this is what it really looks like. If you take the same distribution, multiply it by 100, you see there's a lot of things out there floating around there in Earth's vicinity. Now, this is a little bit deceptive because you have to make the pixels brighter in order to see them. If you drew them actual real size, they'd be too small to see. So again, here's the Earth's orbit, and that is the, the million or so asteroids larger than than 40 meters. I'll explain why 40 meters is an interesting size. So that's, you know, that's a little bit bigger than this room. Okay, this room is probably about 20 or so meters across. <coughs> so, um, solar system is a busy place. A lot of things hit the Earth. So, the picture I took on this when I was on the space station. Um, I like this picture because it cannot be taken from the ground because you notice that this is in the black and that is not. Um, lots of asteroid impacts on the moon. Turns out that you can count, uh, it's a pretty simple undergraduate project if you want, you can count large uh, craters on the moon, divide by the age of the moon, account for the fact that there was something called the late bombardment which was a busier time in the solar system's history, but you can basically do this math and you can calculate by, or you can essentially count the number of asteroid impacts as a function of asteroid size and uh, scale it up for the Earth because the Earth is larger and has a larger gravitational field but fairly simple mathematics and you could say how many asteroids on the larger size there are as a function of size. Really not a lot of doubt about that you can look at uh, because it's, they're, they're basically right next to each other in the solar system. You can also look up in the sky and see uh, shooting stars. Um, there was a pretty good example of this on February 15th. A rock just about the size of this room, it was uh, uh, 18 meters, 17 meters across, uh, exploded over Chelyabinsk in Russia. Um, impact energy that had to do one half MB squared, 40 kilometers per second, um, is about 500 mega or 500 kilotons, excuse me. So 20 to 30 times larger than the, the Hiroshima bomb. Pretty good wallop. And it's the V squared, right? It's, uh, M is big, not that big, but V is big and V squared is really big. Um, uh, and that's where all the energy comes from. But it turns out that um, these sorts of things happen all the time. The smaller <coughs> asteroids, in fact, there was one over New York City uh, about a week ago, um, probably about yay big or so. Good rule of thumb if, if you want to be smart at a, at a party. Take the mass of something re-entering at a typical speed uh, that it hits the Earth and the energy release is about between 20 and 50 times its weight if it was TNT. So for instance, a one ton asteroid would have an explosive energy of about 20 to 50 tons of TNT. Okay? 
So some orders of magnitude here. Uh, 15 kilotons of TNT was <coughs> Hiroshima. Um, one megaton is an extraordinarily large nuclear weapon. The largest weapon ever tested is 50 <coughs> megatons. Okay. Um, so a, an, another good rule of thumb, one <laughs> cubic meter of water weighs one ton. Rock's about twice as dense, so, um, but, it, but it, it isn't you know, necessarily a cube. So a one meter diameter asteroid has about 20 to 50 tons of TNT equivalent, which is a lot of energy. That would take out a, you know, a neighborhood, for instance. I mean, a good size whole city blocks. Okay. So, it turns out that these things hit the Earth all the time. The smaller the asteroids are, the more there are, because they're formed by a process of collisions. So, these asteroids naturally break up into smaller pieces. So, um, we can actually count these because they happen all the time, and we monitor them. Uh, anybody have any idea why we monitor for bright objects that are loud? Weapons testing. Weapons testing, yes, indeed. And missile launch. We have a network of satellites looking down, and we have a board called Infrasound Sound Sensors listening for a very loud sound, which you could actually hear that explosion in each other, by the way, um, around the world. Um, but because of that, that data, that data has been declassified for the purposes of counting asteroids. And not working either. There we go. Okay. So the uh, 40 years of data it happens uh, multiple times per year. Um, the smaller you go down to the sort of, you know, this size sorts of things, you know, you're talking many, many of those per year. And so we have very good statistics. So you can match that with the counting of craters on the moon, two independent ways of calculating how many asteroids are on you. There's a third way. We have telescopes on the ground looking up for asteroids. Now, if an asteroid comes close to the Earth, and it's, it's, um, then you can pick it up with a ground-based telescope. And if it's on the dark side of the Earth, not towards the sun, you can, you can see it. And if the moon isn't full and so on, it's not a cloudy day, you can pick them up. But we know what fraction, what volume of space we've covered that way. And you get a third yet independent way of counting the number of asteroids. What you get is this. This is a power law distribution. There is math in this. This is the size of the asteroid versus the number of asteroids. The, the blue dots are the data. A little bit of a strange dip here. I can talk about that. But it's a power law distribution. That means lots of small ones, not so many big ones. And you can change the, the, the axes to be instead of size, because the speeds are all roughly similar, to uh, impact energy in megatons. So you could label it that way. And you could take, instead of number, you can write in how often they hit the Earth. Okay, fairly simple, just uh, axes rearranging. Again, this is the data. This is Tunguska, this is 1908, June 30th. There was an explosion of about five megatons uh, in Siberia, seems to get hit a lot. Um, this is the one that knocked out the dinosaurs. Okay, so that's so 10 to the eight, once every 10 to the eight, once every 100 million years or so. And um, you know you can look at the size here, 10 to the 8 megatons. Okay, that's why it wiped out nearly everything on Earth. Okay, basically heated the entire Earth's atmosphere around the planet to about 500 degrees. Big giant flash fire. Most everything died on that day. Okay, um, so wh what are we down here? What, what are these sort of interesting numbers here? Okay, um, again, um, the interesting thing is uh, you can see the error bars are quite small. So when people talk about the discussions of number of asteroids and they say, well, there's some disagreement, they're talking here 10%, uh, 20%. Okay, so it's, it's not large. And because of the fact that it's three independent means, it's, it's, it's pretty, not a lot of modeling went on in there. It's mostly counting. Okay, so let's put this thing into perspective. Uh, five megaton impacts, that's a Tunguska. 1908 was the last one, 105 years ago. Uh, it's about a 40... Um, current estimates are actually a little under 45 meters, call it 40 meters. The odds in 100 years, uh, it's about 30 percent. Okay, what's well, just consistent with the fact that we saw one 100 years ago? Uh, so there, that, that translated another way, there's a 30 percent chance in this century upcoming that there is a random five megaton explosion someplace. It's kind of interesting actually, huh? Um, just to put that in terms of 
odds that people might have a feel for. That 22% is your odds of dying cancer, so that your lifetime is about 100 years. So just for um, comparison purposes, so you understand the day-to-day -day odds. You know, this is, you know, your daily odds of dying of cancer are roughly similar to the odds of a five megaton impact or occurring on the same day. Right. That that means. Um, True, most of the Earth is unpopulated, and if you take a random spot on Earth and put a five megaton explosion, you may be just fine. Maybe over New York City. Um, sure would be a shame if the next one happens over someplace that's, that we really care about, right? So let's go a little larger. Let's go to 140 <coughs> meters. That's something that would fit inside Stanford Stadium pretty comfortably. Um, 45 meters is probably roughly this, you know, half the size of this building. Or no, maybe roughly the size of this building, half the size of Duran next door. 140 meters is, would fit easily inside Stanford Stadium. That's an energy of about 100 megatons. For scale, that's about five times all the weapons used in World War II, including the atomic weapons. So that's a very big explosion. And in this century, it's about 1%. Kind of worrisome, huh? Um, uh, again, for scale, um, your odds of dying in a car accident, according to the National Safety Council, is about 1%. So your odds of dying in a car accident, each and every single day, is the odds that on that same day, will be a random 100 megaton explosion, World War III. Mm -hmm. um, and so I always ask people, hey, do you wear a seatbelt? Would you drive a car without anti-lock brakes or airbags? If so, why not? Or why? Right? Generally, people go, oh, I, that would be stupid not to do, you know, take common sense precautions. But the question is, what common sense precautions are we taking with the Earth? Because even if this is not in a populated area, I posit that that would be a bad day on Earth. Um, at least, you know, globally, economically, you know, even if it didn't kill 50 million people, it still wouldn't necessarily be good. Okay, let's get even larger. Let's talk about ones that are one kilometer across. This is pretty big. That's 40 gigatons. Um, the odds in 100 years are actually 0.01%, not 0.001%, or once every million years is what that translates into. But the NASA Space Guard Survey has found 90% of those. So in the next 100 years, you can drop that by a factor of 10. That's why it is 0.001% in the next 100 years, because we've ruled out 9 out of 10 of them. Okay. That is almost exactly the same, according to the National Safety Council, of your odds of dying due to an earthquake. And we spend a lot of money on earthquake safety. Um, uh, up until a few years ago, um, it was a truism. This is a quote from my friend Dave Morrison over at NASA Ames, who said that the total number of people working on asteroid defense would be just about enough to staff two shifts at a McDonald's. It's a little more now. It's probably about four or five shifts. So here's the interesting part to, um, that's, c that uh, surprises a lot of people. Deflecting asteroids is actually the easy part. We know how to deflect asteroids. You sometimes read in the newspapers about some crazy means of deflecting asteroids. Some guy will say, we're going to paint them or something like that. Recognize that those are mostly reporters trying to write some kind of cool story. Okay. Deflecting asteroids is relatively simple. Okay, I'll explain to you why. Um, the situation is this. You know, the Earth is on its orbit. This, let's call this the orbit of the asteroid. And they, remember, they're both just going around the sun inside an orbit which is stable. Okay, so it's just a repeating pattern over and over. And if these two trajectories cross at a point, at some point there's going to be a collision. Um, if you ever remember those old uh, demolition derbies where you'd have a bunch of junk cars driving around two separate tracks, and sometimes, you know, as long as they get to the intersection at different times, it's okay, but eventually they run into each other. Um, that's what this is. The Earth is going around the sun. We know its orbit very, very well. Let's say there's an asteroid whose orbit crosses it. Remember I showed the orbits. There's a million of them out there that, whose orbit's larger than the one that struck Tunguska, the sort of five megaton case. Um, and this is the situation. And it's just a matter of timing. If they show up there at the same time, there's an impact. If they show up there at different times, all's well. You got to wait till the next orbit and see what happens, right? And that's why there's about a million of them who, who cross like this, okay, across nearby. And that's the situation. So how do you get it to get an asteroid to miss the Earth? Remember, it's all about timing. The Earth is moving about uh, 65,000 miles an hour in its orbit around uh, the sun. Uh, 
it's about 8,000 miles across, so it's about one-eighth of an hour, right? So it goes through the intersection in about one-eighth of an hour, right? So seven minutes, right? So even if you were a dead, dead square hitting it here, uh, if you make the asteroid show up early by three and a half minutes or late by three and a half minutes, no problem, right? So it's just a matter of upsetting the time. And you're, in the end, you don't actually have to change the trajectory very much at all. You need to change its timing. Okay, that's, that's the proper way to think of it. So um, what you basically need to do is make it be here when the Earth is here. Okay? And to give you an idea of how much that, uh, how much velocity change that is, let me, let me just move on here and I'll show you how it's done. But the, the velocity change that you need in general, if you have decades of notice, is a fraction of a, of a centimeter per second. So you know, that's something like this. Okay, and uh, remember that these things are moving at a typical op orbital speed around the sun, similar to the Earth, 65,000 miles an hour. If you make it 65,000 miles an hour plus or minus this, when you get decades ahead, you'll find that it's, it's a couple minutes earlier or a couple minutes late. And that's just because, let's say I find an asteroid 50 years before it's going to hit Earth. Um, that's, its orbital period is close to one year because it's crossing through Earth's orbit. It's going to go around the sun 50 times. Right? So if, in other words, if I make it, each orbit lasts longer by a few seconds, um, and, but it has 50 orbits, you know, it's cumulative, right? So it, let's say it's a little bit slower or a little bit faster by, you know, 10 seconds, something like that. 50 orbits later, there's 500 seconds, all clear. And that's how you do it. So the real question is, how do you make an asteroid uh, change its velocity by fraction of a centimeter per second? And that doesn't take much. Simple physics tells you you simply just run into it. Um, it's called a kinetic impactor, which is a fancy schmancy term for run into it with a small spacecraft. We've actually done this with a comet. Uh, it was a mission called Deep Impact. It wasn't for the purposes of deflecting it, but, it was, but it's the same, same physics. You just uh, fly and you just simply run into it. Um, it's a, uh, you blow material off the surface. That tends to go backwards and, and you impart a slight change. And if you look at the amount of change and even and for most of these sort of 100 meter cases, 200 meter cases, that's just fine. If you need to do it precisely, you can do something called a gravitational tractor. You can, you can actually just hover nearby, cant your jets outwards so that the jets aren't pointed straight at it, but outwards, hold position. And this sort of a fraction of a Newton of uh, gravitational force is enough to tow this. So if you need to do it, a precise change, um, this is quite feasible, and all current technology, okay? The hard part is you got to have lots of warning, right? You can't be finding the asteroid even as close as a decade in. You pr it's probably, there's probably nothing you can do. If you're, if you're within a decade, if you think about it, how do you even get a spacecraft there, right? Because it's going around the sun, the Earth's going around the sun, it's got to come close by the Earth at a previous point so that you have a launch trajectory that actually gets there, right? So, you know, inside of five, five to ten years, you may or may not even have a launch opportunity, all right? Let alone how long it takes to build, prepare, and, and test this thing. So, under a decade, this is extraordinarily hard. Not to mention the fact that the amount of velocity change is a hugely nonlinear function often of time, meaning lots of velocity change needed in close. And, and you can understand why that is just sort of, um, it just sort of makes sense. The closer something is to you, the more, you know, angular change you need to give it or the more fractional change you need to give it in timing wise to miss the Earth, right? Farther out, uh, many orbits ahead of time, then, you know, a tiny change in its speed adds up to a much larger change, um, you know, many years out. So, mm -hmm. so is it that if an asteroid is already on its path that you could deflect it in a really brutal manner by sending a nuke over there and it would... Well, like you could actually use a nuke, but, the, uh, but remember that in space you don't get the same shock wave and so on, and that kind of nuclear explosion gives you a fraction of a centimeter per second also. So you could, you could also do it that way. Um, but that's not going to... Disrupting an asteroid is quite difficult, as it turns out. Um, and, uh, but uh, even the nuke's not going to do any good if you can't even get to it. Right, so the real key here is that you got to get lots of warning, and and the beauty of it is that that's actually possible. 
okay? Uh, we understand orbital mechanics well enough that you can measure orbits well enough that you can get decades of notice. So the key is simply going out there and finding these things, and um, that allows you to know if you, if you need to do something, right? I just thought this was a cool, it's actually on a t-shirt which a friend of mine gave me. So, um, and here's somebody who didn't take that for uh, uh, literally enough. Um, we started a foundation called the B612 Foundation about 10 years ago, myself, a couple other astronauts, a guy named Rusty Schweikart who flew Apollo 9, um, uh, a couple of um, planetary scientists and so on. And we were looking at the problem of deflecting asteroids, thinking that, you know, how do we go about deflecting asteroids? And us and a number of other scientists it, over the decades so realized, hey, this is really fundamentally possible. Um, and that, in fact, um, it really, the most important thing was to find them first. Because if you don't know where something is, there's by definition nothing you can do about it, right? If you don't know something is going to hit you, there's nothing you can do. Um, so about a year and a half ago, I was giving a talk at Google. And I mentioned this sort of sad state of affairs that we knew how to deflect asteroids, yet we hadn't found them. You know, again, the numbers, the completion statistics, which are on the previous graph, if you look carefully, you could see the a red line below the other one, which it being a log scale meant you've essentially found it, very few of them, that we we don't know where more than 99% of the threatening asteroids are. We've not tracked them yet. We know the total number, uh, but that doesn't help you. And yet we have the technology to protect them, to deflect them. So we, in this situation where the next large one to hit us would be one in which we actually had the capability to do something about it. And I was remarked that that's kind of silly. Um, you know, we could get wiped out. You know, those odds that I showed you in that previous thing, you know, 1% of 100 megaton uh, impact in your lifetime. It's not that small. We insure against things a lot less likely than that. And this guy came up to me and he goes, oh, how much would it cost to actually find all those asteroids? I go, well, you know, ground-based telescopes don't do very well at this because asteroids are dark. They're almost charcoal colored. Uh, they have typical albedo of a few percent, um, between sort of four and about 12 percent, 15 percent, um, which means that they're, they're, they're hard to see from the ground because they're also small, right? And again, from the ground, you can only point your telescopes in one way and you need good weather and you need <coughs> wide field of view, you're looking for moving objects, et cetera. Um, I said you need to go to space, you need to do this in infrared because they're, they're brighter in infrared because they're, they're dark. They get warmed by the sun. They have a typical temperature of 250 to 300 degrees Kelvin. You'd need to put this telescope not near the Earth, but well inwards in the solar system so that it can look outwards at the orbit of the Earth. And uh, I said it would be a few hundred million dollars. And the guy goes, oh, so why don't you just go ahead and do it? You know, typical Google guy. Um, I used to work there, so I, I'm familiar with the type. So he. he he goes, let me explain. I go, I, I'm like, I don't see how you, how you could do that. He goes, well, let me explain. He goes, have you considered the fact that you don't necessarily need to do this as a government program? He goes, well, because could you put together a team that could do this? And how much would it cost you? I go, oh, a few hundred million, right? He goes, well, you know, we're, so I just donated money to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Um, you know, anyone been to it? It's right by Moscone Center. Great place. Um, and uh, they're building a new wing on the museum. And the new wing, at the time, they were raising $400 million for the new wing. Uh, since, up, according to the website right now, it's $550 million. Okay. But that was his point. Though. He goes, hey, you know, it's private citizens in, in San Francisco are going to raise the money to build the wing of an art museum. Wonderful thing. And uh, so if we could build, if we can raise a few hundred million dollars to build the wing of an art museum, can you raise a few hundred million dollars to save the world? And so that's when we decided that that's what we were going to do. Can you so put your name on the side of the asteroid that you're deflecting? <laughs> <laughs> you we could etch it there, yes. No, um, uh, there, there, we decided to go about this in exactly the same way they raise money for a museum or performing arts center. And there's, at any given time in the United States, there are lots of projects like of this size. I mean, on this campus, the, uh, there are a number of buildings which have been built by alumni that, that are pretty close in size to the project to save the Earth, right? Um, 
few hundred million dollars. Uh, there's been a couple in the last few years, actually. In fact, Stanford's last fundraising campaign raised six billion dollars, right? So, quite a lot more. And, you know, I, so great for Stanford. I'm an alumnus, so they ask me for money. Um, but uh, the point is that it seemed doable, and so we announced uh, last. June that we were going to in fact do this and we decided to put together the team to do this and it turned out to be kind of interesting because there is a lot of pent-up frustration amongst us NASA veterans in how things are run in the in federal procurement how we go about you know the there's a lot of rules that are put on for very good reason for preventing um, people steering contracts to their friends and so on um, but those rules also slow you down if you know the right path Okay, um, uh, so I recruited uh, Scott Hubbard, who's over next door. Many of you may know him. He is the he's the former Mars czar, former head of NASA Ames, um, one of the most experienced spacecraft guys in the world. Um, a guy named Harold Reitzema, who ran uh, the science mission. Uh, he was science mission director at Ball Aerospace, which has built the Kepler Space Telescope, the Spitzer Infrared Telescope, Deep Impact, for instance. Um, the instruments for Hubble. Um, we recruited a guy named Tom Gavin, who was from the Jet Propulsion Lab. He uh, was head of mission assurance, so he's making sure all the missions worked for all of the big missions for the last 30 years. And um, we essentially asked, um, we asked, you know, I asked each of them the same question. Um, if you could do a space project in a perfect world, how would you run it? And they all said exactly the same thing. Well, you know, we'd go straight to the contractor that we knew was the best one. Uh, we would write it as a, you know, if it was something where we would not use uh, technology that's so far out there that the first thing you have to do is develop all the technology. We would run it on a fixed cost basis where the contractor has uh, a re signs a contract. This is an amount, you know, and then this is the amount of money that we're going to get if we successfully complete this. And um, they thought that you could do this mission for a few hundred million dollars. Um, and then I said to all of them, uh, well, that's what we're doing. You know, do you want to be part? And every, basically, every one of them said yes. So we put together what I think is the world's finest spacecraft team. Um, and uh, we started up last year. Um, we signed a contract with Ball Aerospace. Again, they built the Kepler Space Telescope, which is finding uh, extrasolar planets, and as well as the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope. And we're building um, the following spacecraft. This is it. It's called Sentinel. Launches in July 20th, 2018. Uh, this is about 25 feet high. Um, it is, again, an infrared space telescope. It uh, has a uh, wavelength range of four to a little over 10 microns. And it is going to image and look for these moving objects, which are the asteroids. And what it is going to do is, is scan the sky and then rescan the sky and look for the objects that are no longer in the same position. And we'll talk a little bit about that, because that's a very interesting question, how you know which object went to where. It's a very interesting computation question. Um, but it will discover roughly a million asteroids over a six and a half year period between 2018 and 2024. And it will, it, a good way to think of it is that all the other telescopes combined for the last 30 years have discovered about 10,000 of these. And we'll discover that about in the first two weeks. So it, it's just far more effective just because of the geometry where it's located, not on the Earth, but interior to the Earth, and because it's infrared. And so here's where its orbit's going to be. I'll show you, depict it. Out. Um, it is going to, there is its orbit. Here's the Earth. It's actually a very similar orbit to Venus. And this is roughly what it can see um, as it scans across the sky. See, it can find asteroids that are in the, it's basically scanning Earth's orbit. From this interior orbit, it goes around the sun about every eight months. And so it will, over a period of years, scan and, and pick everything within its field of view. It picks up and it can track. We can piece together the orbits and calculate if any of them, those orbits uh, are intersecting with the Earth and if there's a danger of, of an intersection. and give ourselves that warning. So um, we're launching on a Falcon 9 rocket. We're going to use a gravity assist off of Venus to enter our final solar orbit. Um, the telescope itself is something that's interesting because the, uh, the spacecraft, this mission really wasn't possible even 
I would say, 15 years ago for a couple of reasons. N number one, infrared detectors uh, were, n that science has rapidly uh, developed. We did not have detectors with low enough noise. And low noise is important because uh, if you think about what the detection of an asteroid is, it is a blip on the sky, you know, a, photon, a bright spot on a pixel that is not bright the next time, right? And it's bright somewhere else. Well, that's basically noise looks like moving objects, right? So you need to get your noise levels way down. And that's something that wasn't, you know, even in this, sensitivity in this band with low noise is not something that was, that was possible 15 years ago. Uh, number so, so what advanced um, there, there's been huge advances in all areas of semiconductors in the last 15 years. And uh, it turns out there are, are other uses for some infrared detectors, you know, um, both military and civilian. Um, uh, you know, night vision goggles is an example. There's just huge advances. <coughs> okay. um, there have been missions flown that have flown cryogenic uh, infrared detectors, and because of that, you know, they've pushed it, and each successive mission has pushed the, the, the technology along. Um, the next thing is onboard processing. Um, we are going to be, if you think about it, between 30 million miles from the Earth and 170 million miles from Earth. Because the Earth is about 100 million miles from the Sun, and it's orbiting the Sun at about 70 million miles. So sometimes it's on the other side of the Sun, sometimes it's on the same side of the Sun. And as all, you all know from who are, anybody here who's an electrical engineer knows about data rates, the further you are, the smaller the signal, the lower the data rate. You cannot send that much data. I mean, it's a ridiculous amount of data because what we are going to do is scan the entire sky and scan it again later that day and scan it again, you know, a couple days later. And if you think about that enormous amount, and you know, with, uh, it's, uh, with these huge detectors, like it, our detector is about that big, actually. Um, you can't send that amount of data from 170 million miles away, not without an... Uh, you know, an antenna that's just prohibitively large and uh, using up all the time at the Deep Space Network. So um, the key is to do onboard processing. And this is where the sort of computational aspects of this become kind of interesting. Uh, I, I, I neglected to mention, I should have mentioned also, that um, NASA is now involved in our project. What they are doing is providing use of their ground antenna system. It's called the Deep Space Network to transmit our data. So. Um, NASA does have an interest in finding these, these objects, and our sort of pact with the world is that as a nonprofit, we are going to put all the data online. Um, and NASA, um, their role is uh, to provide the, the antennas on the ground, which they already own and operate. Um, and we will, we will receive a few hours a week of uh, communications time. So what we do is we store on board. So what we do is we look, um, let me draw this little thing. That this is the, the sort of field of view of our, our telescope. So this is a picture of the sky, and this is what we're seeing at any given time. Our detector is made up of smaller detectors. And what you do is you take an image of the sky, then you take another image, and so on, and you cover the sky. Then you come back an hour later, and you have to position this thing exactly, but that can be done, uh, using guide stars, and you take a picture of the same image, right? If the objects are moving, it's not in the same spot, right? So you do that one hour later, and you get these points that are different, okay? So if there was one asteroid in the field of view, it's an easy problem, right? Bright spot here, bright spot here, okay? What if there's two asteroids in the field of view? There's two bright spots, and now two other bright spots. Which one goes to which, right? One of them is a physical orbit, meaning it, that could be an orbit around the sun because it's moving in a Keplerian orbit. The other one's likely to be non-physical, meaning if you look at the direction it was, oh, that is not, you cannot find any orbit around the sun that doesn't, that, that corresponds to those points, right? But what if you go to three or four? This is an N combinatorially difficult problem, right? Now, considering that we're tracking up to a million objects, okay, this just becomes an enormous problem. So the way we're going to do this is instead of downlinking the entire pixel, mo majority of the pixels black, all right? Uh, majority of the pixels are black. What you do is you, you, we cut out a region around each object that is bright above a threshold, and we send just that area down. So that cuts down on the, um, the numbers of uh, pixels that we send down 
uh, right there. And then you just detect the ones that the, you just send down the pairs. Okay. Uh, now, which pair goes with which, we don't know yet. So what we've done is that you send down just the pair, the things that, that you know, move from here to here, the locations of the pairs, but I don't, you know, I send down pairs, essentially. Um, and on the ground, there is a routine which goes through and a big multi-processor routine which says, okay, which ones of these are physical orbits? Which ones can I even throw out? If it's gone too far, from here to here, that's moving faster than the speed of light, uh, you know, so, but that depend. but I don't know the distance from the camera just yet. So there's a, um, there's an algorithm that it does to try and make it not n combinatorially difficult, and it, it's actually, it's pretty decent at doing this. Um, what we actually do is we do this uh, one hour apart, then we do it two days later, and then we do it again 26 days later. And that allows you then to piece together these things, these things are called tracklets, into Keplerian orbits. So big processing problem. This is going to go on at the Minor Planet Center. It's, uh, um, it's located in Cambridge. Uh, and that's what they do for the observations of asteroids currently. We're going to send them a flood of data. Again, our data rate is going to be roughly 100 times the current data rate from all other telescopes combined. Um, so we are working with them to make sure that they have their uh, equipment and facilities upgraded in time to handle this, um, but they're they're part of our data processing team, and uh, we are will then calculate. They will then calculate the orbits. This will all be placed online, and uh, the raw data, in fact, is going to be sent to other locations too. There is an independent group which you do want to have that's located in Italy that does the same thing. They have an Italian version of the same program written by different people, because again, if you're talking about tracking an asteroid that may hit the Earth. It's good to have two totally independent uh, uh, means of detecting it, right? And then what you will do for those that are actually threatening is then, because you now know exactly where to point, you can point something like the Hubble at it or one of these other telescopes at it, provided you know where it is. You can't do that um, until you make the discoveries. This is a survey instrument, very broad field of view. Hubble is like looking through a, a straw. Right, so we, gotta help, we have to tell those telescopes where to point. So that is the process. Um, again, it's going to be very interesting times starting in 2018. Uh, and um, this, in the end, is, is what we're trying to do. I, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to protect this place. And it's kind of an interesting thing that um, at some point our, our civilization has to solve this problem, right? Because, you know, roughly every million years or so, there's something large enough to wipe out humanity. Hits, hits, uh, it's not enough to cause a mass extinction, but enough to end human civilization. That's about every million years. The reason we believe that is that the one kilometer asteroid, if you look at how much dust they throw up in the atmosphere, um, pretty clearly would end growing seasons both northern and southern hemisphere for a few years. And uh, given that the Earth's stockpile of food at any given time is a few months, that means you run out of food long before you get any growing seasons again. And um, it's pretty hard to imagine that, that civilization would look the same after something like that. It's about every million years that happens. And our feeling is that that shouldn't happen. And um, you know, we're, we're working with the government. We are a, government, a private public partnership. But we decided we didn't want to wait um, to go through the, um, you know, the, the, the budget goings-ons in Washington. Um, you know, NASA and, and the federal government have been great partners um, thus far. And uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very supportive of what we're doing. Um, and uh, we're going to put this data out there. And there, if we do our job properly, you know, this planet shouldn't be struck by a large asteroid from this point forward. Uh, which is a sort of uh, puts us in an interesting time, right? I mean, um, this could not have happened 100 years ago. We didn't have rockets. We didn't understand orbital mechanics well enough. Uh, we clearly didn't have such telescopes. Um, but nowadays, we do. And our feeling is that uh, we should deploy such a thing because we can and because it would be kind of stupid for us not to. So that's what we're up to at the B612 Foundation. If you want to find out more, uh, b612foundation.org is our website. Um, I have, uh, I'm testifying in front of Congress again next week. 
I testified in front of the Senate uh, a couple of weeks ago discussing why it was, in fact, that we didn't see the asteroid that, that struck Chelyabinsk, and the answer was because we're not looking. Um, but, you know, it's a sort of unsatisfactory answer that you have to give, but that's the case. But, you know, there's hope. When we're operational, we'll, we'll find, uh, we won't find all the Chelyabinsk, those were fairly small. There are other ways to find those, but we'll find anything that could, that, sh that would cause real damage, we believe. And uh, so it's, it's going to be an exciting few years. Um, telescope's being built right now. So I'm happy to take any question that you've got, any comment that you've got, any suggestion you've got. <laughs> Feel free. How long will it take the satellite, once it's there, to see, say, 99%? Um, it, how, how long will it take? 6.5 years. Um, the satellite will likely last longer than that. You can continue the mission. And what you get then is the ability to find smaller and smaller asteroids, the longer. Because the smaller asteroids need to come closer to the telescope in order for you to spot them. So, it, And it's a statistical thing, right? Because they're moving around. You just have to wait until it comes within that distance of the, of the telescope. Um, the interesting thing is that the map, the three-dimensional map of the, the solar system that you create is good for roughly 100 years. That's when the orbits begin to drift due to non-gravitational effects. And so that means that you don't really need to redo this survey for about another 100 years. So the beginning part of the 22nd century is about the next time you'll need to redo the survey. Mm -hmm, in the back. And this is how much uh, data is actually created uh, on each scan? How much data? Well, uh, I think it's uh, God. Number of megapixels is in the range of fifty million, um, but then you're taking an image every thirty seconds, and it, so that adds up. So fifty million megapixels. Fifty. Megap 50 oh, excuse me. Fifty megapixels uh, every thirty seconds, three. You know, continuously. At, at, at the, you get a lot after at the end of uh, not too long, right? Mm -hmm. Where did 26 days come from? Um, that just happened to be the tiling pattern that ends up. It, it, and by the way, that that scan pattern that I showed you and the and the 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 revisit time, they they want the hourly, then the set two days later, and then the 26 days later, is not set in stone. W one of the things that we've realized is that you can optimize this because the distribution of asteroids is not isotropic. It's centered around the plane. You can, you can adjust both the cadence of the observations as well as the scan pattern to optimize some of these numbers. And they're doing that now. Um, over the next year or so, we'll have a much better feel of how to optimize that. So you got a lot of variables you can play with, right? Do you want to do it? Um, so for instance, there's been a discussion of doing three observations in close, followed by, instead of two days later, like say something like six days later with three observations in one day. You know, is that better than two and two? It might be. Um, it's a pretty big phase space. And what the way to, to solve the problem is to build a giant mathematical model that includes the expected distribu the, the distribution, the known distribution of asteroids in both in size and orbit, your orbital position, your optical performance, the performance of the detectors, your, uh, your algorithms for finding them, and your data transmission rates, and then, then vary them and run, turn the crank. All right? And then you know, vary your parameters and see how, how things uh, uh, move you know, in terms of your overall detection rate. And uh, we already know that what we've done is not optimal, but it works. Uh, but that's an ongoing research project right now. It's being done by uh, a couple of folks in Colorado right now. Well, there's a number for, led by a couple of folks in Colorado. What, do, what kind of statistics do you think you're going to get? Like how, what fraction of various sizes? Oh, OK, yeah. Um, will essentially be astronomically complete down to the 100 megaton level, the 140 meter asteroid. So that's astronomically complete is considered around 90 percent. And uh, we, by the time you get down to the Tunguskas, at the end of six and a half years, you'll be about 50 percent complete. Um, that's if you only go six and a half years. You know, the, the way most spacecraft work is that they either die early or they go well beyond their expected lifetime. We don't have consumables like uh, a helium doer. We're actually uh, cooled by a mechanical chiller, which is a uh, mechanical Stirling engine. So we run at 40 degrees Kelvin. So we can run much longer than six and a half years. 
So um, my, uh, I believe you'll you'll mostly you'll be in the probably 80% range. I'm, I'm guessing roughly. Uh, again, these numbers depend upon how we end up choosing our our scan pattern and our revisit pattern. Uh, it can be optimized more, but you'll probably get 80% by 10 years on the Tunguska scale or larger. Mm -hmm. Is it cryogenic? Uh, cryogen it's 40 degrees Kelvin, but it is not using a helium doer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, nitrogen. Uh, no, no. Cryo cool. Oh, 40. No, 40 degrees Kelvin. It is using a uh, mechanical cryo cooler, uh -huh. yeah. such as been used on other other spacecraft. You're talking about a single large telescope. Uh, how, how did you say what the diameter was of the? Uh, the spacecraft itself is about 25 feet high. The optics, it's a 50 centimeter IR. Um, 50 centimeter is the is the you know the main mirror size. Um, there are a handful of Earthbound <coughs> efforts, the Pan Stars. Yes, system, yes. It, this is has a 1.9 meter. Yes, um, but none of those are in infrared. Right. And that's the, that's part of it. Which seems like a terrible oversight on their part. <laughs> well, no, you you can't do infrared from the ground very well because of the uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. And uh, so the, we have two things going for us. Number one is infrared, and number two is, is the vantage point that we've got. Geometry adds an awful lot to this. It, it would seem that this is a hugely partitionable problem. In what one sense? big scope versus 10 somewhat less expensive scopes versus No, you, we, we looked at that. Um, it, it's not really that partitionable at all, actually, because you bite off in a certain amount of expense, but simply by getting a rocket and getting something out there, okay? And um, so we did this sort of multi-dimensional uh, optimization with size of the optics, observing, you know, the observing wavelengths, the operating temperature of the focal plane, you know, what, uh, wh whether we want to be at 0.6 AU or 0.8 or 0.7 or 0.9 or <coughs> whatnot. And, and in the end, you find out that you really quickly converge upon um, a single telescope, 50 centimeter optics, uh, 4 to 10 micron. It, it's a pretty solid solution. And in fact, the National Academies did a study on this uh, independently, and they came to the same conclusion uh, that, that was just published uh, about uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, so they did an independent study of this. And we based a lot of what we, we're doing on their findings. So you do have an optimal design. But once you've done the design work and engineering and prototyping and testing and launched one, what would be the cost of launching the second one? Uh, for most spacecraft, if you buy a second one, you're in the sort of half or less of the first one. Um, so we are looking at, we are raising $450 million over 12 years. And that pays for design, test, fabrication, launch, rocket, operations, the control center, all people, and margin. So um, that's uh, and typically when people quote spacecraft costs, they, co they quote just the spacecraft. We're quoting, you know, total life cycle cost. So um, uh, I believe that if this mission was done via federal procurement, and not that they couldn't do it, they could absolutely do it. They'd probably be double, maybe a little more. And and that was the National Academy's estimate was a billion dollars. Getting any interest or support from any other governments besides Uncle Sam? Uh, nothing. Nothing definite. There's some discussions, but nothing definite. Um, it's one of those things where kind of everybody's been looking to somebody else to do it. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, approximately how much does say the deflection <coughs> mission cost? Deflection mission cost would be really dependent upon. Uh, how big the asteroid is, how many years notice you have, all sorts of things like that. The, the good way to think about it is that uh, the deep impact mission um, was probably around $500 million. So it puts it in the, it's not, you know, maybe one-fifth of a Mars lander. So it's similar to the survey mission, but it, yeah. it would have a definite purpose. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. probably likely that Yeah. So my that. feeling is that Federal government and the governments in general are very, very good at confronting a threat that's definite. Mm -hmm. You know, when you find something, you <coughs> will be able to say that this asteroid will hit Earth on this date, at this time, at this place. Um, in fact, a typical error ellipse for for these things is about five kilometers. So, I mean, we'll be able to tell w within a five kilometers or so where this thing's going to hit. Okay, five to ten kilometers. So. Uh, if you issue a warning like that, you know, 
this asteroid this size hits here on this day, my feeling is that, that, that funding is an issue at that point. What long lead time planning can you do before the warning? Uh, I think it's prudent to test a deflection mission on a non-threatening asteroid. Yeah, so yeah, you okay. know that it works. I mean, all great in principle, right? But until you've actually done it, you know, you have Rehearsal. To, I think it's prudent. Um, and in fact, there is a discussion, uh, there is a European-led coalition that is doing a study on this, and there's a discussion that there might be some European money to do such a thing. Um, uh, we'll see if that materializes. I think we'll provide them some impetus because <coughs> we're going to start finding so many of these things that it's going to, people are going to go, well, it would be nice to actually know that for sure that we can deflect something. Um, Back? Um, do you have any uh, crossover or communication with the, the asteroid mining people? Oh, we know those guys pretty well. Um, <laughs> they, uh, are, they are wholly dependent upon us to be successful. They <laughs> cannot find asteroids. <laughs> okay, so, um, and remember again, an asteroid you don't know where it is, you cannot mine either. <laughs> so, um, there has been some statements that, that some of them are building telescopes. Those are not survey telescopes, mm -hmm. so they will not find asteroids. But if you tell it where to point, again, you might be able to find something, perhaps, if their optics are big enough. I don't know. Um, they're small telescopes with, you know, sort of low performance. I don't know if that's even possible or not. I can tell you they will not find asteroids, though. They're not survey telescopes. Are they providing, providing you some of the funding? Those guys? No. No. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, the come back the Earth could also be hit by comets, but mm -hmm. are there a lot fewer of these and that's not a problem? Comets could hit the Earth, but there are rough, a good, roughly 1% number of comets versus large asteroids. Um, and so uh, we, uh, there's nothing we can do about that that we know of right now. Uh, it shouldn't stop us from solving the 99% problem, I don't think. Uh, when you survey this and you get these millions of objects, how frequently do these millions of objects interact with each other? And not that, that not that frequently. So that that number that I quoted, that okay. roughly a hundred years is about when you begin to need to redo this. That's when there, these little perturbations begin to add up, uh -huh. both gravitational perturbations as well as non-gravitational perturbations. Things like off-gassing begin to have an effect on about a hundred-year time scale. So that's they're pretty pretty much Keplerian orbits to a very high accuracy. So what is the earliest impact date that you think you could avoid? I mean, I just did I, it, it, again, it's, it's orbit dependent and so on, but uh, um, we're launching in 2018. You know, if we found something right away and it was within, you know, five, ten years, you have a shot. Ten years, you have a pretty decent shot, I think. Twenty years, you, you know, the problem gets radically easier the longer the, uh, the lead time is, so. That's the danger you want to, you know, time's a wasting right now because, again, it would be kind of silly for us to get wiped out um, <laughs> for no apparently good reason, right? Because we choose to not spend an amount of money equivalent to the Wingham and Art Museum. So how is your fundraising going? It's going pretty good. Um, we only started real fundraising last June. June 28th is actually the day we started. Um, and we've raised enough money to get through the first of our eight uh, major technical milestones leading up to launch. The eighth milestone is launch. Second major one is coming up at the end of this year. Um, I mean, the team's all in place. Um, the facility, the high bay where it's being built, has been opened. Um, we have uh, started uh, building prototype detectors. They've been run down to 40 degrees Kelvin. They've been, uh, we are running uh, additional iterations. Uh, detector work is a bit of a black art. We expected a number of iterations and that's what we're doing. Um, by the end of our next major review, each of the individual subsystems will be, will have its, its requirements uh, and performance requirements specified and how that all fits together with, each, with every other subsystem. Um, uh, these things called trade studies where you say, hey, I want to make this thing a little bigger or that thing a little smaller or whatnot, and how does it affect the overall system? Uh, we've done, uh, as of a, about a month ago, we finished 75 of those trade studies. Um, we expect about another 50 more to go. And uh, we will have preliminary data on some of our systems uh, by the end of the year. 
So it's moving pretty well. So we funded all that thus far. Yeah, a few years ago there was a talk of an asteroid that might have a, a near a near miss in 20 or 30 years. I can't remember the name of it. it was Apophis. Press. Yeah, it was pressed quite a bit, but it was a. It took them quite a while to figure out. Um, I saw projections going all kinds of different directions. It took them quite a while to nail down the orbital mechanics yeah. of that. What? How, how are you avoiding that issue, or what issue did they have? The, it, the issue is that when you observe from the Earth with ground-based telescopes, you can only see it when it gets close to the Earth, right? Now, for asteroids whose orbits are very similar to the Earth, let's, let's say its orbit around the sun is 1.1 years, okay? That means it's near the Earth one year, and it doesn't come back it's on the, for 10 years, right? It's on the other side of the sun, and you don't spot things very well on the other side of the sun. And that meant we went for long periods of time with no data. So you were just sitting around going, well, you know, in four more years it comes back and we'll know then, right? And that was what the cause of a lot of that angst. We'll prevent that both because our ability to spot them is from so much further away. We won't have these short periods of tracking where you only see it for a couple of days and then you don't see it for, you know, a, a year uh, or a couple of years. We'll, we'll track them for months at a time. So the error bars will be much, much smaller. Also, you don't lose the telescopes on the ground. So now you have two independent places where you can spot from. We'll at times be on the other side of the sun. So if you combine the, the effect of both, you actually reduce that false alarm effect by an awful lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so why do you think there has been so little attention and resources devoted to this asteroid problem as opposed to like earthquakes, let's say? Well, uh, I think it's because Unless it's in somebody's recent memory, they discount it. That's just human nature, right? So until the events of February 15th when that asteroid hit, everybody was going, well, yeah, we know those odds, but ah, right? You know, there, there were a lot of people in the city of New Orleans in 2002 who said, we should fix the levees. <laughs> we're going to get hit by a hurricane. But the people in New Orleans chose to say, I don't even remember the last time a big hurricane hit here, right? And look what happened in 2004. Okay. In 2005, they all said, we better fix the levees, but nothing had changed, right? <laughs> except it was in people's recent memory. And frankly, people aren't necessarily good at decision making. We spend a lot of money on a lot of things. You know, you, you know there's, there's value judgments in everything, right? So I don't want to say that you know, one thing is better than or another, but the fact of the matter is there isn't dispute about the odds. And if you think about it rationally, these are the odds that you're, we're, it's a giant game of roulette with the Earth, right? Each and every day we, we see if we win, right? Most days we win. Does that mean, uh, but you can't keep winning forever when you're playing the odds, right? It's the way it is. So we figured we just go do something about it. How much is it going to cost to move an asteroid? Uh, that was the question up here. So uh, my guess it would be sort of a similar cost, you know, a few hundred million is my guess. But, uh, I mean, to do it in a controlled way that you knew, you know, that, you know, again, if you're talking about something that, that's a clear public safety hazard, right, you better make sure you do it right. So, yeah. Um. You, uh, could you talk a little about uh, your, you said the data would be public? Yes. Well, just about how and the yeah, um, that. we are going to put it on the same way everybody, all the current astronomers put their <coughs> observations online. We're going to use the same system. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. The, the, right now, everybody sends their observations through to the Minor Planet Center as the clearinghouse, and it's distributed from there. That's what we'll do. And other telescopes who want to do follow-up observations can do that. And they have a warning system that if something's close by, you know, other it's can track it if it's going out of the field of view and, you know, the system works pretty well. We want to work with the astronomical community. Uh, we're not trying to you know, hold tight to our data. That's not our plan. Isn't there a, at least a small chance that that will be misused and lead to sensationalism? Um, <laughs> like my encounter? I, I suppose. If yes, at all possible, it yeah. will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think in the end, you know, I think openness is the right solution. I, I, I really am against the idea of hiding data from the public, so I don't, I don't think we should go down that road. Uh, we're not going to do that. 
how does one determine the size of a distant object if you don't know its reflectivity yet? Ah, okay. In optical, you need to know the reflectivity, which is why optical observations of asteroids have a very large error bars. Um, because you remember that I said the reflectivity is anywhere between 4% and 12%, right? So you could be off by a factor of two or three in how, you know, how much, you know, how big that thing is, surface area. In infrared, remember you're looking at one minus that because it's the absorption that you're looking at, right? Because it's re-radiated thermal. So you're looking at one minus the point somewhere between 4% and 12%. So in other words, the amount absorbed is somewhere between 96% in 80 something percent. In other words, it's a pretty small error bar now. And, and they radiate as a black body and it's pretty, actually, that's the other benefit of going to infrared is it will have a good handle on the size of them that you don't currently get with optical. Once you know the orbit, then you know the distance, then you just calculate the size from that. How are you going to deal with a sequester when NASA can only <laughs> collect half your data? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we're going to deal with that. Uh, no, but remember, we are a private organization, right? So we are, you know, but uh, God knows what would happen if they shut their, tel their ground-based, you know, antennas down. You know, then we would have to figure out a way to raise money to do that ourselves. And it's doable, right? I mean, these are, th that, you know, people know how to build antennas. But I, I, I just don't want to rebuild infrastructure that's already there. Not a good use of our donors' money. Again, if, if you do want to find more, uh, b612foundation.org. If you think it's an interesting thing, if you want to get involved, sign up on the website. Heck, donate if you feel like it. Um, or tell other people. But to me, I think this is, I'm hoping this is inspiring to kids and to people that we can actually go out and change the solar system in some way to protect our own planet. You know, that's a fairly grand thing. Um, you know, four and a half billion years, this particular planet has been struck by asteroids and it's shaped the evolution of life on this planet, right? Um, there have been many mass extinctions. The, the dinosaurs was one. In fact, we're here as mammals because of the extinction of dinosaurs. But we can actually, we can actually stop that, right? We don't want to see our bones like that, that dinosaur in somebody, some future civilization's museum. And that to me is an inspiring thing, you know, that I feel like um, this is a, a, a grand project that's almost on the edge of science fiction, <coughs> if you consider what we're doing. You know, you're, you're going to modify the solar system so that the, one of the planets is no longer struck by asteroids. Um, but it's doable. And, uh, you know, and it's doable using uh, astronomy and <coughs> detectors and orbital mechanics and, our, our, uh, and rocketry and, and so on, and I think that's wonderful. Could you say a little bit about the camera and or the computer behind it? Um, yeah, we, the, the camera itself, uh, again, the, the, the heart of it is a detector that's about yay big. It's a Mercury Cadmium Telluride detector. It's formed of uh, 16 <coughs> smaller detectors that are butted up against each other. Um, the, the processing done right on the back side, um, standard flight processing computers. Um, they, they, they have flown before. I don't know the exact missions that they've flown on before, but um, we're trying not to reinvent the wheel whenever possible. <coughs> so the, the telescope itself, the, the, the baffling and so on, and the structure is actually a reuse of the Kepler Space Telescope bus because the, the, the same team built Kepler. Much of the optics is derived from the uh, Spitzer Infrared Telescope. So uh, that allows us to do things much more rapidly and cheaper because there is uh, a lot of been, a lot of uh, design and testing has already been done on that. That was a big part of why we were able to bring this thing into a commercial contract. So, so the flight computer has what kind of processing power? Um, it is a standard. It, the flight computers are a little bit different than you know computers here um, because they you have <coughs> to handle high radiation environments. And so there's a lot more error correcting that goes on. So it, it, it's not really an apple, it's the Apple's comparison. You can't compare it to a, you know, an Intel processor or something like that in terms. There, there's a lot more steps that go on there because we are going to be fairly close to the sun. There is a lot of radiation and you need to be able to handle that kind of radiation environment. So um, maybe we can talk afterwards, but it's not a, to throw a number out there, you'll be misled. 
maybe we'll make this the last question. So I would guess on the population, you get a lot of people who could care less. Mm -hmm. You get a few people who really believe this is important. Mm -hmm. But I also suspect you might get a few people who tell you you shouldn't be doing this and that they're upset about it. Have you had that kind of feedback? I have not. Okay, good. I've heard mostly, you know, there's a lot of people in the first category, and there are some people in the second category. And this is very similar to the, the guys raising money to build a museum, right? The majority of people of San Francisco did not contribute to the museum, but there were some residents of San Francisco who felt it was important enough that they have that new wing of the art museum. Yes, if you have to talk to some of the Amish, though, yeah. That's what I'm wondering, yeah. is what if you can get some kind of feedback about your playing God, please don't do this. Uh, I have not heard that. No. <laughs> okay. And I suspect their tune may change if, if it was actually headed towards them. Yeah. If such a person existed. And I, again, I have not heard that. This is the survey mission with the rescue mission. So some of those. Yeah, we're a little bit re removed from it. But uh, anyhow, well, thanks for your time. Um, we have uh, done a lot of work, and a lot of it is online. More of it is going online. Um, we published our, the first of our peer reviewed articles is up. And uh, more forthcoming, and Senate tes or Congress testimony next week. So you can throw uh, fruit at your screen if you see me on it. Thank you. <laughs>